as a young citizen of India, armed with technology, knowledge and love for my nation, with the vision of transforming India into a developed nation, I am joining Shobhith University. What about you? Very good morning to all the participants from India and abroad. So with the Institute of Engineering and Technology, Meerut, deemed to be university, Center for Agricultural Informatics and E-Governance Research Studies, and Center for Agribusiness and Disaster Management Studies, extend greetings to all the participants from India and abroad who are attending today's national webinar series on doubling formats income by 2022, Atma Nirvar Bharat in Agriculture. This webinar series is being hosted on every Thursday at 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. Indian Standard Time. Today is 30th of September 2021. The web this webinar is on the topic, very important subject, post-production interventions, maximizing value for farmers. Let me repeat, post-production interventions, maximizing value for farmers. On behalf of the Honorable Chancellor, Honorable Vice Chancellor, the faculty members of the university, and on my behalf, and as Professor Emeritus and Chairman of Centers of Excellence, Center for Agricultural Informatics and E-Governance Research Studies, Center for Agribusiness and Disaster Management Studies, Center for Informatics Development Solutions and Applications, and Center for Industry 4.0 Studies and Applications, and Center for Health Informatics and Computing. Let me welcome the today's guest speaker, Mr. Raj Bharadhan is independent director McLeod Russell India Limited Kolkata consulting agri expert access access advises Delhi president international food and agribusiness management association USA and former senior vice president Wallam International Moscow Russian Federation for the benefits of the participants and the guest speaker so far under this webinar series, the university has organized 46 webinars on the topics, namely, <coughs> sorry, role of agricultural cooperative societies and e-governance, blockchain technology-based fishery value chain, a self-contained village felt in need of the day, spices informatics network value chain, land and a camera, a cam camouflaged treasure trout, Smart Hill Agriculture, a digitalized hill agriculture value system. Mara Mobile, Mara Marketing. Integrated Mariculture, Aquaponics and Precision Agriculture, in short, MAPA Biofarms for Income Revolution. Smart Tribal Agriculture, Optimizing Value Chain. Digital Agri-Tech and Industry Perspective. Land Resources Information System in India, present and road ahead. Weather decision technologies for increasing farm income, big data in smart farming, sustainable soil and land management for climate smart agriculture, understanding market dynamics for increasing farm income, role of technologies in mitigating crop risk, how to generate additional profit via simple attractive approaches in farm produce, adoption of flexi rubber jet tam technology, potential benefit for farmers in rain fed and coastal agro ecosystems realizing the economic benefits of agroforestry across all organic humic solutions for increasing crop yields and quality while increasing farm income and improving soil health closing the nutrient loop phosphorus management in protein farming improving nutrient use efficiency and farm productivity artificial intelligence enabled pest management technology for agricultural crop protection without pesticides empowering farmers through extension and knowledge dissemination role of mass media Pou smart poultry monitoring solutions agro biodiversity intellectual property laws agriculture and farmers welfare and insight into the issues for indians agrarian economy manufacture and application of biochar for increased soil fertility and crop productivity sustainable integration of livestock with agriculture for farm income increase Role of geographical indi indications on improving farmers' income lessons from Asia and Pacific region. Dairy informatics network value chain, a dairy tech startup perspective for farmers' income increase. Spices informatics network value chain, a turmeric startup perspective 
for farmers income increase generating sustainable on farm income through fintech interventions nutrition sensitive agriculture pathway for increasing farmers income artificial intelligence and data analytics to ensure optimal nutrition in the soil harvested food that minimizes human diseases bioenergy supply chain a business opportunity for rural enterprises and farmer producer organizations tech enabling india's tech starved farmers for manifold increase in productivity and income open insurance ecosystem for agriculture producers risk management solutions to overcome repercussions on farmers income market stability and food safety role of mass media for farmers income increase a case study from green tv at stack agricultural stack open source digital infrastructure for the agriculture ecosystem a linux foundation project circular bioeconomy towards resilience urgent need for redefining raw materials and modified waste management policies and regulations agri tech new horizon in indian agriculture supporting of farmers for marketing will only help doubling of farmers income doubling of income by 2022 rural transformation for farmers income increase case studies from impoverished districts mobile enabled software as a service to solve complex supply chain challenges a case study from daily orders john dirais journey in india integrated precision agriculture solutions doubling the income of farmers through eco agri agri revolution bears carbon farming initiative today is the 47th edition of this national webinar series which will be addressed by mr raj varadhan the president of international food and agri business management association corona valleys usa on the very important topic post production intervention maximizing value of farmers keywords are post production intervention maximizing volume and farmers this webinar series has has hosted the following webinars related to this topic smart to tribal agriculture optimizing value chain understanding market dynamics for increasing farm income role of technologies in mitigating crop risk how to generate additional profit via simple attractive approaches in farm produce bioenergy supply chain a business opportunity for rural enterprises and fpos and tech enabling india's tech starved farmers for manifold increase in productivity and income and supporting our farmers for marketing will only help doubling of farmers by 2020 doubling of income by 2022 as you know that agriculture sector is the foundation of the indian economy it employs more than 50% of the india's workforce and contributes almost 70 to 80% of the gdp at present agricultural livelihoods are being severely impacted world over as a result of anthropogenic global warming and climate change india's labor intensive and subsistence based agriculture sector is particularly vulnerable to this development climate change has both the direct and indirect effects on agriculture productivity including changing rainfall patterns severe drought flooding and changes in the geographical redistribution of pests and diseases indian farming community comprises of about 14.5 crore operational holders of which 85% of the farmers are, are small and marginal operational holders farmer needs timely location specific and the personalized information for effective control on their production risk and then market their produce to identify the market opportunities many national level programs such as digital india make in india skill india startup india stand up india have faced operational problems difficulties for its impact at farm level and and at the farmer level that to at the small and marginal farmers honorable prime minister in his independence day address on 15th august 2021 he has spoken let me quote in the coming years we have to address we will have to address the collective power of small farmers of the country we have to give them new facilities they must become country's pride chota kisan bane desh ka desh ki shaan small farmers you know become the pride of the nation doubling farmers income by 2020 report 
you know it has suggested reforms towards digitalization of agriculture in particular i was associated with this uh, during the draft formulation as a group chairman group leader for two committees volume 13 and volume you know volume 11 and volume 12 b volume 12 b talked about digital technology in agriculture government of india through its national informatics center has prepared it blueprint for agriculture sector through a national conference on informatics for sustainable agriculture development is done in may 1995 and smart village scheme 2002 2007 and 2007 and 2012 and also government of india launched a national e governance program in agriculture in 1995 volume 3 volume 4 volume 11 volume 12 b of the doubling farmers income by 2022 report to 2018 of the government of india have suggested reforms measures for income rise through digitalization of farm sector volume 3 talks about post production agri logistic maximizing gains for farmer volume 4 talks about post production intervention agricultural marketing volume 11 talks about empowering the farmer through extension and knowledge dissemination and volume 12 b digital technology in agriculture the digital technology in for you know agriculture talks about seven mission mode programs for complete digitalization of farming systems life cycle digital technology and innovation in agriculture synergization of digital india make in india skill india and startup india programs for transformational reforms in agriculture sector through smart irrigated farming smart rainfed farming and smart tribal farming digitalized agrometer advisories and agricultural risk management solutions digitalized agriculture resources information system and micro level planning for achieving smart village and smart farming digitalized value chain for about 400 agriculture commodities digitalized access to input technology knowledge skill agricultural finance credit marketing and agribusiness management to farmers digitalized integrated land and water management systems and digitalized farm health in management for reduction of farmer health to synergize farmer health plant health animal health soil health water health and fish health Doubling farmers income this committee report in its volume 11 section 3.2.5 suggests the need for development of a network of cooperative societies coopnet and automation of each cooperative society e cooperatives to facilitate governance and operational efficiency in the cooperative sector is good for rural india the three farm act 2020 is a game changer which were enacted by the government of india during 2020 Atmanirbar Bharat, the road ahead. This is the mission of our vision of our Honorable Prime Minister, Sri Narendra Modi of making India a self-reliant nation, rested on five eyes, intent, you know, inclusion, investment, infrastructure, and innovation, and based on five pillars. Quantum jump in the economy, infrastructure one that represents modern India, and systems 21st century technology driven, vibrant demography and demand whereby the strength of our demand and supply chain should be utilized to full capability capacity vocal for local and make in india for global the reforms announced have been systematic planned integrated interconnected and futuristic for creating strong inter enterprises generating employment and robust supply chain this is our intent and during the as a third trench of Atmanirbar Bharat Abhiyan, the government of India has also, you know, and now, you know provided 1.5 lakh crore as a booster for agriculture sector. Let us come to the topic of today's important post-production in agriculture. In agriculture, post-harvest handling is the stage of production immediately following harvest, including cooling, cleaning, sorting, and packing. Post-harvest treatment largely determines final quality, whether a crop is sold for fresh consumption or used as an ingredient in a processed food product. Post-production intervention, agriculture marketing. The <clears throat> fourth volume of the report of the Committee on Doubling Farmers Income examines the status and reforms needed in the agriculture marketing system. A clear differentiation is proposed between the system 
that facilitates marketing of agriculture produce and the, mo the modes to connect the produce to markets. The latter is a physical function and is discussed in the first part of this volume. The former is an en environment and the logic behind the function to guide and enable the ways that agriculture produce can realize optimal value, farmer and, and, and the market. In the opinion of the Doubling Farmers Income Committee report, an efficient market system is only a necessary condition and does not ensure that the higher price discoveries are automatically transferred to the farmers producers. Farmer, farmer producers. It therefore concluded that monetization and not marketing alone should form the fulcrum of the post-production phase. It is logically decided to consider a complement of agri-logistics, value addition, and agri-marketing as an integral as integral to the efficient monetization systems. In fact, the committee also recognized that monetization has to be supported by appropriate farm harvest practices. Agri-logistic, the vol uh, third volume of the committee report focuses on agri-logistic, which enables connectivity between production and consumption zones over both space and time with minimal loss of quality and quantity. It considers various aspects of agri-logistic with the primary focus on preconditioning, storage and transportation of farm produce. The farmer records improved logistics to move the harvest, to choose the time of transaction. They need the cold chain for perishables or safe storage for food grain and for a change in in a farm, they need near farm processing facilities to feed the raw material. There exists an organic link between agri logistics and markets, which entails a seamless transfer of produce to complete the monetization process. The parliamentary panel report submitted in Lok Sabha 3rd January 2020, 2019, underlines that the country is yet to solve the riddle of agriculture marketing. 69 to 73 percent of the rice and wheat to produce in 14 years was not procured by FCA or state agencies. Shortage of APMC markets in the country. Regulated markets far off from farmers. Far off from farmers. Poor state of infrastructure in the APMC market. Poorly implemented regulations of the APMC Act. At least one gram hub must be present in each panchayat. This is about six recommendations. Agriculture value chain financing, opportunities ahead, lack of access to affordable credit. Is I will, will like to quote from the address by the chairman Nabard in Omnicom webinar, sustaining the agriculture sector through collectives, cooperatives, and the farmer produce organization post COVID-19. He talks about there are certain issues in the agriculture value chain that need to be identified and addressed if India has to harness the opportunity that is presented to itself at the farmer's level. The issues need relate to limited access to better inputs, including credit and technologies, low marketable surplus, coupled with the absence of aggregation mechanism, inadequacies in warehousing facilities, inadequate risk management intervention, to address production and market risk. At the market intermediary level, the issues related to inadequacies in infrastructure for produce handling, sorting, hack trading, dominance of unorganized trading, restrictive APMC acts, qualitative and quantitative losses, opportunities profit ring, opportunistic profit ring, multiple layers in marketing channel contributing to high prices high price built up which neither benefits the producer nor the consumer when it comes to logistics the issues largely related to connectivity in rural areas use of open trucks even for perishable produce which is the most predominant mode of transport absence of an integrated cold chain and high cost at the processor or in the user industry level the issues related to long disjoint supply chain there are too many non-value adding players, layers. There are no controls over quality of raw material 
sourced in the absence of adherence to grading by producer or public intermediary. The concept of traceability and product standards I have to penetrate. Contract farming laws is seldom honored. Issues relating to higher costs of procurement and erratic supply of raw material, food safety hygiene issues, especially due to large unorganized processing sector, short, short period processing period or single product. Besides the above issues, the agriculture value chain also conferred, confronted with other issues like low investment in quality control, product innovation, market intelligence, and lack of brand building and access to organized market players. Agriculture supply chain optimization and value creation in an article which is written on May 12, 2020, you know, in, in, the, in the website mackenzie.com. It says supply chain processes are inherently complex across industries with the multiple functions interacting with the different potentially conflicting objectives and numerous dependencies between material and information flow. The agriculture supply chain is further complicated by fragmented inbound and outbound networks. The typical agriculture supply chain involves three steps from farmers to intermediate silos, from silos to transformation plants, and from transformation plants to client. Each step records multiple decisions. How digital twins can help. Advances in digital and analytics technologies offer a way to optimize agriculture supply chain. The agriculture industry is capturing more data than ever on everything from agronomy to the weather to the logistic to market price volatility. Data storage capacity has increased, storage cost has plummeted, and computational power has grown. Meanwhile, both predictive data science and prescriptive optimization techniques have matured and gained visibility. One compelling way to use one compelling way to use digital and analytic technologies to create a digital twin of the physical supply chain from farmers to end consumers and use it to run virtual simulations and optimization. Digital twins can in include all elements of supply chain and its interfaces, including procurement, production, inventory points, transportation, warehousing, and points for sale, points of sale for finished goods. Players can calibrate mathematical models to include a variety of objective functions, such as profit, throughput, cycle time, or inventory optimization, depending on the organization needs. With this input, let us now turn to the address of Mr. Raj Vardhan, Independent Director, McLeod Russell India Limited, Kolkata, Consulting Agri Expert, Actors Advises Delhi, President, International Food and Agribusiness Management Association, Coronavallis, USA, former senior vice president, Olam International Moscow Russian Federation, on the very important topic, post-production intervention, maximizing value for farmers. Today's topic will generate and galvanize the participants watching over telecast through Facebook.com, Soviet University India, YouTube.com, Soviet University in, or LinkedIn dot com slash company slash sobit dash university for establishing agri tech startups more than 6500 agri tech startups one per block or even about 2.25 lakh agri tech startups one per each gram panchayat to promote post production interventions in the country through the operationalization of digital technology in agriculture digitalized value chain and digitalized access to inputs in this talk Mr. Raj Vardhan will discuss about post-production intervention, both in India and abroad, to benefit small-scale farmers to who represent 85% of the operational holders in India. Let me invite our guest speaker to address the participants. Before that, let me introduce our guest speaker to the audience. Mr. Raj Vardhan. Is independent director, McLeod India, Kolkata, consulting agri expert, as advisor, Delhi, president, International Agri Business Management Association, Anavalis, USA, former senior vice president, Wallam International Moscow Russian Federation. Mr. Raj Vardhan, what for 
25 years with Wolam International in multiple emerging economies in a senior leader leadership position. Wolam International is a Singapore listed agribusiness focused, agribusiness focused, value chain diverse to multinational. It is amongst the largest global agribusiness companies. Mr. Raj is currently consulting of uh, consulting of a test advisor as an agri expert is working with them on a government sponsored agri infra infrastructure project. He is also on the board of McLeod Russell India Limited as an independent director. McLeod Russell India Limited is the largest tea plantation company in the world. Mr. Raj Vardhan also leads a US based global agri business focused not for profit organization international food and agribusiness management association usa very good morning mr uh, raj Bardhan. we welcome you to address the national webinar series on doubling farmers income by 2022 atma Bharat in agriculture on the topic post-production intervention maximizing values for farmers over to you mr raj Bardhan, for your address Hello, Mr. Raj. No. Okay. Are you able to see my screen? Yeah, yeah, yes, yes. No. Um, so first and foremost, um, I would like to thank uh, Shobit University, the Chancellor, the Vice Chancellor, uh, and you, Professor Moni, for giving me this platform today to share my ideas on the issue. Uh, for putting me in the August company of all the people, speakers who have preceded me, you know, doubling farmers' income is a very passionate goal, and it's a very noble, lofty idea. So I'm happy to be in that uh, small August company. And thank you for sharing all the information that you provided this morning. And also for you know uh, uh, inviting me for uh, this session today. Um, I would like to also extend my gratitude for the generous uh, words that you have you know put out there for introducing me uh, with your permission i would like to just take the next couple of minutes uh, to talk about efama uh, which is an organization which i am associated with for uh, quite some time um, efama is uh, uh, it, it's it's uh, um, it was way back in 1990, it was felt that there was a need for a platform for academicians and government agencies to come together, especially in the area of agribusiness, as there was no such uh, organization which existed back then. So in 1990, uh, this organization was incorporated and it was then known as a pharma, a yama, uh, and the word F, letter F was added much later. And these are some of the founding fathers of uh, IFAMA and founding members of IFAMA. Uh, Ray Goldberg, uh, he's a Harvard US University professor. Ray Goldberg is about 92 years old, still very active, a giant in the agribusiness uh, industry, very well known. And he was the first president. IFAMA is uh, a not-for-profit organization. It is, uh, it is based on three foundations. Uh, three stakeholders essentially it has uh, uh, academics it has professionals and it has students as members it is diversified in terms of geography given the global nature of the organization it has people from various countries so therefore it has a geographic diversification however it is very focused because it is only in the agribusiness industry and only pertains to agribusiness uh, this is just a slide on our heritage. I won't go into details of this. Talks about various places where you know we have had conferences, various people who have led it and who were the first. Uh, 2021, uh, like Professor Moni uh, informed this audience, was when I took over the leadership of IFAMA. I'm the first Asian to lead this organization. Uh, IFAMA holds global conferences annually. Um, 
it has been always been a physical conference except for the last two years because of covid we've had to go into a virtual format uh, the conferences have three segments it has an academic symposium where uh, people who are in academia come and present papers uh, to their peer groups uh, there's a business forum where uh, people come in and talk on pertinent relevant issues uh, in a panel and then there is a global state uh, student case study competition which is a global championship between various universities participating then next if our conference is going to be in june in costa rica uh, these are the various countries where in cities where if ama has had its conference as you can see we have a global footprint uh, across various continents um if ama also has a journal uh, which is a peer reviewed journal called if ama uh, which is for people in academia if they want to present a serious paper then they write to the journal there is support uh, in terms of editorial support uh if amar looks at impact factors and measuring impact factors the current impact factors about 1.442 um it is collaborating with wageningen academic publishers in netherland for the publication of this uh if amar journal we have quarterly this comes out every quarter sometimes there is special editions and therefore we may have more than you know four in a year we may have five to six um currently if ama is looking at you know just like all civil societies we are also looking at focusing on capacity building so one of the things that we are looking at is a more project based approach and trying to see how we can look you know build capacity among farming communities and that's a new direction that if ama is looking at currently let's talk about what is the value proposition for people joining if you are from academia then you know if ama gives you an opportunity to publish in if ama Uh, if you are a member then it allows you research if ama research previous uh, issues one can look into I, you can engage in collaboration with colleagues i know of number of colleagues in the organization you know somebody is in brazil and somebody is physically based in the us and they visit each other and consult together or go to each other's classes and teach so you can invite people from industry or academia to come into classrooms um there are industry visits which happen during conference we also organize workshops for academia um, professor brian cross from uh, michigan state university teaches case study method and this is for people in academia who want to know about the case study method and how it is done and if people are from industry then it explores uh, research and consulting opportunity uh, it provides uh, you know promote company uh, through student interaction so we ensure that there is sufficient industry and student interaction uh we also assist the industry with hiring opportunities and provide networking for collaboration and comp with competitors and collaborators um what is it for students uh, it's a platform for you know advertising on internship and job opportunities career counseling we have had you know webinars on career counseling specially organized uh, it uh, provides a network with other students and academia outside their own you know academics institution that they are attached to and industry professional in agri business um allows you an opportunity to participate in global state uh, case study competition which is a physical uh, case study competition which happens um industry visit during uh, conferences that we also provide mr raj uh, can you yes. just go to the previous slide that uh, previous one what is for the industry what is for the academia oh okay so oh, just for that is there something that you want yeah, to yeah, highlight yeah. fine fine no because i was noting down so okay carry on okay so i talked about students and then you know uh, various multilateral agencies and also you know are also a part of this and also civil society organization um so coming back to you know the issue that we need to discuss today which is um essentially on coming uh, post production harvest uh, post production intervention what are the things that we can do and uh, looking at how how all that is going to impact uh, income for the farmers 
Now, um, let's talk about the history of regulated markets. Now, uh, history of regulated markets starts with the advent of British uh, occupying India, where regulated markets were essentially for sourcing cotton uh, out of India for textile mills in UK. And that was the genesis of uh, uh, the regulated markets. And post-independence, uh, the government of India then, you know, gave this the shape of what is today known as the APMC markets. And uh, the focus was essentially on providing food security. So in 1947, um, as you know, during British times, there were so many major famines which happened in India that that uh, naturally became the focus for India. And everything that has been, whether it was policy, uh, in the 47 and in 60, subsequently was around security and about providing adequacy. But look at the reality on the ground. So if you look at 1960 as a basis, then tomato has gone up by 40 times, wheat by eight times, poultry by three times, fish 13 times, and uh, milk eight times, eggs 40 times growth in production. And for all of us who know about the Malthusian theory, which talks about, you know, food grows at a geometric progression and population grows at uh, an arithmetic, uh, sorry, population is growing at a geometric progression and food at an arithmetic progression. Naturally, there is going to be, you know, pressure on food systems because uh, it's not going to be able to support the population. And Malthus's theory was that, you know, nature will take care of itself through natural disaster. But look at India. This is not true. Population growth in this period has only been about 2.8x. And look at how food has grown. So we've been in India ahead of the Malthusian curve. Now, if you look at um, India, India is one of the large producers of agri-commodities. It's amongst the top three nations in the world. Uh, as far as production is concerned, more than a billion tons of production. Uh, but if you notice that, you know, food and vegetables together uh, is, you know, close to 300 million metric tons that is being grown, which is similar to what is grown as far as grain is concerned. And if you look at horticulture, that's attributes to 16% of arable land and 38% of agricultural GDP. But remember, I talked about food security being a concern. Therefore, all our policies in the past and all our infrastructure is towards securing, you know, food grains. And therefore, infrastructure were, and policies were more designed towards, you know, grains rather than horticulture and fruit and vegetables. Um, so the storage is for essentially for non-perishables and not so much for perishables. Um, the only uh, exception here, I would like to talk about the dairy uh, industry, where they don't use the same uh, storage facility as the one for non-perishable. There is a dedicated non-perishable structure. And thanks to uh, Dr. Kurian for the white revolution and the focus it brought about not only in the dairy production, but in the commensurate infrastructure development, which has you know made India... Uh, one of the largest producers of milk in the world. Now, having said that, you know, we all tend to get a little faced by, you know, food losses. Now, I want to talk about food losses, you know, and you will find lots of, you know, especially the news media will tend to, you know, highlight in this. Having said that, I want you to understand that food losses are universal. It happens in every, all over the world it happens. It's not just pe peculiar to India that food losses happens. So if you look at the pie on the left hand side, it, you know, by sector wise, it goes into, you know, various, so 19% in North America, going on to 18% in EU, in terms of, you know, the food losses which are there. And if you look at the orange rectangle, which talks about South and Southeastern Asia, which is 8%, and India is, a, is in that 8%, which is, you know, far smaller as compared to some of the other region which has been put in there. If you look at the bar graph on the right hand side, it talks about that there are the nature of food loss is, you know, wastage by consumers, which happens more in developed nations and uh, as compared to emerging economies. And uh, there is food loss, which happens because of, you know, storage issues and which might be more uh, because of inefficiencies in the chain. Uh, so food losses are 
like I said, you know, it's uh, ubiquitous. It's found all over the world. Having said that, you must understand that, you know, farmers already invested money and resources and time and energy in producing what he has produced. If he's not able to sell it, it reduces the income of the farmer. So this cannot be a justification for continued perpetuation of, you know, food losses and food wastage. So I, the whole presentation today is trying to focus on how this can be reduced at the small farmer level. Let's look at food losses um, and within India, what is the Indian perspective? About 1 lakh crore is lost in post-harvest losses in India. Uh, on, on a daily basis, we lose about 143 crores. It is lost every day on account of farm gate rejection and distribution delays. This is one part, that there is food being wasted. And look at the dichotomy. The Global hun Hunger Index for 2020 ranks India as 94 out of 107 countries. So on one side, we have food wastage. On the other side, we have people who are hungry. So it's very simple to, you know, match this. But these at present are mismatched, and which is why, you know, we're going to talk about this. Um, so let's move on. Uh, Post-harvest, if you look at the post-harvest value chain, and I look at this, you know, what is post-harvest, what are the causes of post-harvest value chain losses in India? So first, let's look at infrastructure. So infrastructure is because the storage is poor, uh, poor distribution, or there is gaps in food processing, you know, between what is being grown and what is being taken, or how far it is being taken. If you look at farmer capacity, you know, so then there could be because of improper harvesting. Harvesting is not being done properly because of that. There could be, you know, losses which happens either on field or during, you know, primary storage at the farmer's location. Grading not being proper, that could be, you know, leaving value on the table. Uh, poor holding capacity. Now, this is extremely, extremely vital when I'm talking about poor holding capacity. And I have a separate slide which I'm going to talk about this later. So I'm not going to elaborate too much on this, but this is important. Just take note that holding capacity of the farmer is very essential. Markets are because of poor, imperfect market information or having limited market losses. Now, what we notice is post harvest losses are more in the early part of the chain. So in the early part of the chain, where the farmer is involved, he doesn't have the capacity, the either the knowledge or the capital to reduce these losses and needs help. And that's where the maximum losses happen. Let's look at drivers of what are these, you know, various segments. So in today's presentation, I'm dividing it into four parts, harvesting and primary processing, storage, logistics and crop protection, processing and market linkages. And I'm looking at what drives, you know, losses. So one is, you know, in harvesting, it's improper harvesting, like I said, or lack of primary processing could be another which drives during harvesting. If you look at storage and gap uh, crop protection, there is a huge gap in infrastructure at the farm gate, especially for cold storage. You know, so like I said, our uh, storage is ma mainly geared towards non-perishable and not towards perishable. So pack houses are, you know, not adequate pack houses. And the nature of the commodity is such that the shelf life is very low. So without structural support, there isn't much hope for the small farmers which are growing this. Um, so this leads to significant spoilage and crop losses. So if you look at processing, then the losses are a count of huge gap in food processing, you know, significantly limiting uh, value addition. And I will, you know, elaborate a lot more as to how India, com you know, compares with some of the other countries that we are looking at. And inadequate processing cap capabilities in terms of what's being grown and what is being uh, value added and therefore leaving value on the table. Market linkages, you know, is an account of losses or an account of market information not being adequate or market access not being there. So on one side, you may have farmers which are, you know, have to throw away uh, their crops because in their local regional market, there is an oversupply situation and there is no demand. Uh, however, in another part of the country, uh, there is a deficit in the market and there is no linkage from a surplus to a deficit area, therefore hurting both the farmer and the end consumer. 
Now, there are various actors in the value chain. Uh, so, there is, I've divided it into the government sector. And what is the role of the government sector? The, everything is, you know, uh, you know, centers around the farmer. So, the government sector, and basically when I'm talking with the farmer, I'm talking with the small-scale farmer. Uh, focus has been on the small-scale farmer because 80% of farming in India is small-scale farming. Where, you know, land holding is less than a hectare of land. Um, so, government sector is provider of uh, intervention, you know, initiates intervention. Um, however, having said that, you know, in India, agriculture is a state subject. And therefore, you know, there could be conflicts which happen and you do see those conflicts. And uh, however, the central government through model acts can, you know, uh, provide guidance to state governments. They provide, the central government provides subsidy schemes and... Uh, they also provide regulation which drives infrastructure. Um, they provide an enabling environment for reducing post-harvest losses through you know, various investments which are possible. Um, the current GST, recent GST impact was something which was to expand markets, especially for small farmers. Of course, it's a debatable issue in terms of implementation, but um, the idea behind, you know, Having an integrated GST, that I don't think is debatable uh, because it leaded to better price realizations for the small farmer. And even the contract farming laws, you know, you see a small segment which is, you know, um, talking about that these laws are harm, are, are not really, you know, beneficiating, beneficiating the farmers. But the fact is that this goes in, you know, in a huge way. Contract farming is already existing. What the government regulation is doing is just recognizing a practice which is already there. Government is, uh, you know, allowed for FDI in agri sector. They have looked at restructuring of APMC markets and uh, connecting all the markets together through the National Agriculture Markets and ENAM initiative. Uh, a big thing was warehousing receipt financing, thereby allowing the farmer to be able to hold crops. And that is something which is, you know, we need to be really thankful for the government's foresight in doing that. Uh, a bridge between all this, uh, between the farmer and the private sector, the civil society. So they are the disseminator of information and the builder of capabilities. Uh, they focus on small scale farmers in support of women help group. Um, they provide the last mile physical connectivity. They provide deep engagement with farming communities. Most of the time they're physically present and living among those farming communities. They provide knowledge, they build, train, uh, capacity building is what they do. Uh, they drive uh, value chain by encouraging farmer aggregation. You know, collectivism in farmers is done through them. They provide linkage with aggregators and processors. Um, coming to the other important uh, player in this value chain is the private sector, which provides the role of a supporter to the farmer. So what do they do? They undertake capital intensive processing, storage and, uh, and, and you know, processing, uh, provide access to procurement chains. So they've set up procurement chains. They connect fragmented demands on one side. So the demand from the customers are fairly fragmented and the supply is also fairly fragmented. So they aggregate demand and they aggregate supplies. Uh, they provide retailing of products and undertake exports. Um, they are ensuring post receipt quality and ensure shortage risk. So once they have procured from the farmer, then the quality and the shortage risk is something that the private players take on. They also manage price risk uh, while, you know, at, at uh, the level of the customers, you cannot have a daily fluctuation of price, but the private sector cannot afford to, you know, keep, uh, you know, for, uh, if you're especially making value added products, then you cannot, you know, deviate prices on a daily basis even though raw material prices will change every day. So they take on the price risk. They extend credits up and down the chain. So whether it's to the farmers or whether it is to the B2B segment. Now let's look at a report card of these players. So if you look at private sector, so let's look at what do they play? What is the role they play? So the private sector plays the role of, you know, in this particular segment of supplying and leasing company for harvesting, uh, they lease equipment, uh, they provide primary processing for export ready goods and midstream processing like milling and feed, feed plants and brewery is something that they do. 
Uh, they provide subsidies. Uh, the government provides subsidies for threshers and reapers to the farmers. So this is what they do as far as primary processing is concerned. And the civil society is for building capacity uh, through information, dissemination, and training. That's the role that these three particular you know stakeholders do. If you look at the private sector, uh, we've said that you know we've given them a yellow on their performance because uh, penetration on harvesting equipment, while that's a start, but it is low, it is not, it has made a robust beginning and I will elaborate a little bit on some of the things which is happening, but it is not all pervasive and there is a lot which can be done. Um, the government, uh, besides formulation of rules in terms of, you know, mechanization, uh, there isn't much which has happened, so they score a red. And the civil society, you know, scores a yellow because they have, you know, brought aggregators and privates together. Uh, but like I said, this is not all uh, pervasive. So uh, there is a lot more work which can be done. So let's look at, you know, what are the challenges which are faced by farmers and private players as far as harvesting and primates. So if you look at uh, challenges, Lack of awareness about price and quality premiums that uh, are prevailing. Farmer is not aware of that. Limited access to finance. Uh, their distance from the markets and for especially for process produce as far as the farmers is concerned. And there is a short term need for liquidity. So the farmer is always in, you know, willing to sell everything upfront in cash. And when I talk about in the next segment, you will understand, you know, this problem of, you know, short term need for liquidity how it hampers the farmer and a big intervention by the government is in terms of providing you know structured warehousing receipt where the farmer can raise credit it's a facility it's a facility which can overcome this but uh, i there are not very many farmers who are aware about it and this facility may not be available to all the farmers which are present in india Look at private players, what are the various challenges? There is an absence of national integrating infrastructure, especially for uh, fruits and vegetables. You know, So there is no national integrating. Like I said, there could be an excess in one area and shortage in another area. And infrastructure, you know, some of where it is uh, nationwide infrastructure, that needs, you know, government intervention and private players can only do it, you know, more at their level to look at a regional level, but not across uh, building infrastructures like, you know, road and railway access or waterway access all across the country. Limited access to uh, finance, you know, especially uh, in primary processing, while the government has done a lot of things, but there is still, uh, especially if you're looking at self-help groups, uh, and, you know, um, and village level enterprise, then you will find that, you know, they're not so much of financing, which is available. Uh, distance from market for process produced. So there might be, you know, distance that could also be a challenge. Um, okay, so let's move on. Private company. Uh, let's look at the interventions which the private company um, and the CSO led initiatives, what are the things which are happening? Companies are driving small scale mechanizing by connecting farmers with financial institutions. So TAF is a manufacturer of tractors and they have connected with Punjab National Bank to, you know, provide uh, funding to the farmers, small scale farmers on products that they sell. Uh, near farm processing for some crops like, you know, cotton, uh, chilies and tomato. Uh, so Grobomac is a company which does cotton pickers. Uh, these are robo uh, cotton pickers. Uh, Yanmar and Agri Solutions provide uh, farm equipments. Uh, and Kormandal is a crop protection company. And there is a very interesting uh, play, which is between Yanmar, which is a farm equipment manufacturer, Kormandal, which is a crop protection, and Mitsui, which is an off taker. They, they have all three come together to set up a joint venture. Uh, leasing solutions by manufacturer intermediaries. You know, paper use, which is coming in, or sublease, or peer-to-peer -peer leasing, uh, or village-level enterprise leasing is a model which is coming up. Um, there is customized small-scale equipment, uh, which uh, is, you know, minimal fuel-dependent, low maintenance, and affordable. Uh, Kamal Kisan is the company which does it for farm equipment. There is ICT leveraging for providing, you know, platforms for purchasing and hiring of agri-equipments 
Farmart and AgriHub are two companies which are doing it. Mobile app for sale of new and used farm equipment, Kheti Gadi and Kisan Munch are two companies which come to the mind. Uh, group leasing of equipments, companies are EM3 and Zamindara, these are the companies which stood that. Providing training on equipment and processing by um, uh, uh, NGOs and uh, support groups. Uh, there is Kishar Producing Company Limited, uh, ISAP, uh, Indian Society for Agribusiness Professional, Professional, which both Professor Moni and I are a part of, uh, are also here, a player in this. Agribusiness Systems International are also, these are some of the companies which are providing support to the farmers in this region. Let's look at some of the companies' exemplars I've pointed out. You know, I've talked about a lot of companies, but I'm saying, okay, you know, let's look at some of the companies which are really, really exemplars in this. So the first example that you see is R Food Pachala. R Food is a company which is looking at low-cost machinery installation, which they, uh, you know, lease out to small farmers, and that is one example. Then I have on the upper uh, right side, Desi versus Desi, a company which uh, gives out, you know, solar uh, dryers to small farmers for producing products. And the farmer, therefore, is not only processing, uh, but it is going to add value, which is then sold through Desi versus Desi, and therefore, farmer income in enhances greatly. Um, there was a company called Thringo, which was, you know, bought over by Mahindras. And basically, it's a platform which is a Uber for tractors. So if you want a tractor, you just go on the platform and you order for a tractor and the tractor comes to you. And you don't need to own a tractor because, you know, the farmer is just going to use his tractor a couple of times in a year when he's sowing or when he is plowing or when he's harvesting. And he doesn't need to own a tractor for 365 days. So this is a new model which is coming up. Um, having said that, I'm looking at, you know, what are the opportunities and white spaces? I'm mindful of, you know, the audience here and looking for, you know, some ideas which might be, and a lot of this is focused towards ideas which government can look at, but, you know, research agencies can look at, you know, further research in this area to see the impact of how this will impact. Um, so suggestions are 100% subsidy for farmer producer organization or village producer organization which is operating in primary processing such as cleaning, grading, drying, sorting, and ginning as a way to double farmer's income. Um, augment uh, uh, civil society support through agriculture universities and specialized agri research institutes, uh, ensuring there is one outreach program in every district and farming cluster. And there should be a monitoring body for oversight on such program by both state and central agencies. Uh, assistant formation of a fr forward freight market for road and rail because today, you know, that becomes decide besides the raw material fluctuation, the freight fluctuation during the, you know, peak harvesting can happen a couple of times in a day. So there is a need for a maturity in this and that is a suggestion that can happen. This doesn't exist today. Infrastructure of waterway transportation while we have railways which still can do a lot can be done roads are pretty you know lots have been done waterways is you know something area of development assist in establishing a forward market for fruits and vegetables so fruits and vegetables are you know perishable and shelf life is low so if there is a forward market then farmers ability to you know sell becomes a lot more if there is a physical forward market uh, this also helps in price discovery uh, formulate regulation for discouraging export of water intensive crops like rice and wheat, uh, especially relevant to a country like India, where, you know, we are resource constrained. This should be highly discouraged. Uh, we uh, cannot be feeling happy about exporting, uh, being the largest exporter of rice in the world at a point of time when people in India don't have water to drink. Uh, we are essentially, you know, exporting water, uh, which is a scarce commodity in India. Formulate regulation to prevent state government influencing labor wages for political regions. This is something that we keep finding, you know, state after state. Every time there is an election, the you know local government will just go and hike uh, salaries locally and has a huge impact for the private sector. There is a need for the central government to you know put a curb on this because it just disrupts. It just simply disrupts every time this happens. Let's look at the second area, which is storage, logistics, and crop protection. So let's establish the need. 
uh, what I've looked at is two crops, onions and tomatoes. And I've looked at a wholesale price index. And if you look at onions, now the harvesting normally happens in January for onions. And if you look at uh, tomatoes, it happens in December and it happens in July. Now, one thing that you see across is as soon as the harvesting happens, price starts dropping. It doesn't matter, you know, and this is true across commodities. I've just picked up this as an example that what is happening in India is the farmer is a price taker. As soon as the crop comes in, he anticipates, you know, he has no information on what is going to happen. He goes by the pricing of what happened last season and that's how he grows. So if last season the prices were low, he tends to grow a lot more. There's an oversupply and because of the oversupply, prices keeps going down. He has no way of storing all this. It's a perishable and therefore, you know, he's a price taker and keeps on losing money. Now, in contrast, if you look at on-farm storage capacities in Canada, on-farm storage is 85%. In US, it's 65% on-farm storage. And in Argentina, it is 40%. And I'm not talking about storage close to farmer. I'm talking about on farm, which means farmer controls this. It is important for the farmer to control it. In a fragmented industry, um, farming society like India, farmers have a, don't have as much land. They don't have as much capital to have storage capacities, but there needs to be some kind of a leasing model so that the life cycle of the product can be extended so that the farmer is not a price taker, which happens in India all the time. If you look at uh, storage log logistics and uh, crop protection, then you find that uh, barring cold storage, we have logistical constraints all around. And how do we you know, ensure that we can plug in this? So at the first step, we need to build integrated pack houses. Step two would be, you know, putting in and would be putting up reefer trucks. If you put cold storage, but you don't have enough reefer trucks, which are plying between the warehouses, then what are the standalone warehouses going to do? And that is an issue today. There aren't enough. Uh, there is need for cold storage where, you know, once you have the pack houses, the reefer trucks takes it into cold storage and you can keep the product in the cold storage. Um, most of the step four is to, you know, finally connect the market by rail, road and water and air. 97% uh, of the market is, you know, mostly done by roads and rest of the things are missing today. Uh, the last step is having ripening units for fruits that are needed for ripening. If you look at future today, the situation is million tons required. Current production is 175 million tons and fruits is close to 100 million tons. And if you look at by 2050, there is a vegetable is close to 100% growth and fruits is excess of 200% growth. So this is the level of infrastructure which is required from where it is non-existent to what needs. So government is doing its bit in you know, trying to help out, but I just wanted to put it out there in terms of the size of the problem. So if you look at types of storage solution, there are, you know, warehouses and integrated cold ch chains. Uh, warehouses is mostly for, you know, um, grains and uh, non-perishable and integrated grain cold chains are for food, uh, for fruits and vegetables. If you look at the government initiative, the warehouses are mainly driven by the government. 76% is, you know, uh, initiated by government versus 24% in the private sector. The reverse is true in cold chain where 4% is by the government and 96% is by the private sector. Um, the infrastructure directly impacts farmers in the warehouse level because farm level storage is provided and rural go-downs are there. And similarly, for integrated cold chain, closer to the proximity of the farmers, this is required. Um, infrastructure higher up in the uh, value chain at the warehouse, we will need you know, aggregation points and therefore larger warehouse. For uh, cold chains, we would need uh, reefer vehicles and large cold state facilities, ripening chambers, waxing chambers, packaging, all that is required. And somewhere there is a need for, you know, government involvement in this, because if you, uh, you know, allow only the private sector, it's going to be very, very fragmented. It'll be inefficient. And in a resource constrained company, a country like India, there is a need for a national in structure rather than, you know, this kind of a fragmentation. 
if we look at a report card what is the government doing um, ownership uh, of storage of grains directly by central government state agencies and they also rent private warehouses uh, they are pro essentially driven by the public distribution system uh, for providing food security that is the role the government pl plays as far as private sector is concerned in it's investing in capital in intensive infrastructure which is suitable for either high value or voluminous products um, they are providing integration as far as pre-cooling, ripening, and pack house part of collection center is concerned, and the civil society basically in farmer capacity building. Um, the government, you know, uh, since public procurement is essentially focused on, you know, non-perishable, and they are recently providing a lot of, you know, support in trying to build the non, uh, non uh, in terms of building the perishable infrastructure in terms of policy intervention. So they score a yellow. The private sector is doing um, um, quite a bit in terms of, you know, the storage infrastructure that they have been building. Um, they're also connecting the smaller intermediaries and, you know, the farmers. Uh, they're trying to bring in on-farm innovation. A lot of new things have happened, but they lack scale. You know, it is not all pervasive. So they score a yellow. Uh, the civil society could do a much better job than what it has done in this area. Therefore, this uh, score uh, red in this area. Um, so let's look at what are the constraints and crop protection uh, challenges. On-farm storage uh, are inadequate and of poor quality. Uh, this is our reality today. Severe shortage of integrated units for fruit and vegetables is not there. Uh, most small-scale farmers had no access to cold room, reefer transports or packaging facilities. And there is unorganized retail markets have shortfall of cold storage, ripening chambers and waxing. So if you look at farmers and consumers are paying for the food losses. So because all these infrastructure is not there, the farmer realization he's invested in growing all the crop that he grow, but it does not reach from the farm to the plate. So since it does not reach there, therefore his realization is a lot lower, even though he has invested in growing 100% of his crop. Um, challenge in, uh, so what are the basic challenges in this part of the segment? Uh, if you look at warehousing, um, warehousing are essentially made from, you know, materials which are locally available. So they are not uh, rodent proof. So some of these infrastructure are very old and decaying and there is a lot of crop losses because of the quality of warehouses which are prevailing. Um, there has been impact by the government on the warehousing in providing, you know, for especially for large farmers and uh, FPOs, which are, you know, now availing of all these facilities and trying to provide more warehouses closer to where the production is. Um, as far as integrated cold chain is uh, concerned, there is a thrust, like I said, uh, but however, there is a lot of shortage. Uh, there is a uh, pack houses, about 99% of the pack house shortage is there in India and that impacts the perishable uh, commodities in India. Um, the government, uh, whether it is through various agencies, and I'm not going to go into each one of them, uh, but I just wanted to put it out there, whether it's through the Ministry of Food Processing Industry, uh, Department of Animal Husbandry, Dairying and Fisheries, Mission for Integrated Development of Horticulture, um, or through various ag agencies like Food Corporation of India, or uh, Agriculture Process uh, Food Product De Export Development Authority, APIDA, or National Corporation Development, um, or the union government itself. There are lots of lots of initiatives and lots of supports and lots of things which the government has off late done. Uh, the Dhaliwal report is the one which you know goes into details of all the various uh, support that the central government is providing. Uh, there's a natural uh, center for cold chain development which has been uh, providing knowledge and there is also income tax act which is various kind of release which is being provided fdi has been uh, provided in you know is approved for in cold chain um, and lots of you know like i said central government and also the uh, state government is also encouraged to disburse funds uh, which is allocated from the central government through the midh funds uh, for these purposes. So there is central government support, there is state government support. Also, there are various models which are coming up, you know, private sector, ITC, eChopal is one which comes to the mind in terms of, you know, providing 
guidance to the farmer and helping in price discovery. And this is a model which has been there for now decades uh, that it has been in existence. Crop Life India is uh, uh, providing awareness and building capacity on crop production among farmers. Tesol is another company which is end-to-end -end cold chain solution between farmers and consumers. Now, so these are some of the companies, some of the initiatives and interventions which is already in place. I just wanted to point out, you know, some exemplar companies have picked up two. One is called Ergos. Uh, Ergos is basically micro warehousing. What they do is they look at, you know, hiring small storage uh, warehouses close to where the farmer is growing. And the farmer can even store one bag if he wants. So this is micro warehousing. Uh, so it has a network of warehouses. They provide, you know, credit uh, to the farmers and they provide access to market. So this is one, you know, in the bringing in farmers and uh, um, and the processes closer. And then Rinak is another company that I want to talk about. This is basically cold rooms that they provide, cold chain solution and the construction solutions that they provide um, between, you know, in terms of providing cold storage of various kinds, uh, which might be, you know, large buildings or it could be, you know, walk-in freezers or it could be small rooms. And that is another thing, which is a development which is happening in this area. Uh, so I thought I'll just put it out there as exemplars. Let's look at, you know, what are some of the opportunities which are out there, which is, you know, can be looked at in terms of white spaces. Government use of satellite imagery for establishing impact of weather on small farms for dispersal during crisis. Today, what is happening is uh, small farm, if they want to access, you know, insurance, uh, until unless the entire region is affected, the small farm by itself is cannot have access. So I'm saying if we can have a process of satellite using satellite emerge, imagery, then even the small farms can benefit from the insurance scheme, which Pradhan Mantri uh, insurance, beam, uh, which is there, uh, if that small intervention is provided for, uh, for protecting crop. Uh, there is a need for providing a corpus of funds for paying farmer when sales realization is below cost of production. So insurance cannot be only when, you know, there is a crop loss. Uh, sometimes, you know, the, there is only farmer which depends on a single crop or maybe two crops a year. And that is the entire livelihood. The farmer can't survive if there is no support. So if in during good times, if the government were to build up a corpus and disperse that corpus during bad times in specific areas, that would help you know, support the farmers. Uh, promotion of indigenous neem-based herbicides for plant care. You know, there is a lot of chemical out there, but India is, you know, can also look at neem-based herbicide and, you know, promotion for all that. Uh, setting up of integrated cold chain, which is solar powered or dependent on endothermic reaction for addressing the need of small scale farmer because electricity is so much of an issue in India. So if these things are subsidized and, you know, there is already some, but if there is a focus on, you know, helping out and taking the cold chain closer to where the farmer is. Uh, promote development of solar powered micro chillers for small scale dairy farmers. Now, while there is an aggregator model which is existing, there are no micro chillers. Because if you look at the companies which manufacture chillers, they are basically geared toward large farmer, not to the single individual farmers, which is, you know, looking at um, ownership of, you know, less than five cows. So if they can provide, uh, you know, support in, you know, developing this kind of a product, then the loss to the dairy farmer happens right after the milking happens. And there is nothing which is present there, which will ensure the quality of the milk. Milk right after it is, you know, um, it, it comes out needs to be chilled to four degrees. And, you know, taking it to the market or taking it in trucks after some time is of no use because it needs to be chilled immediately. Um, so provide support to the farmers for ownership of dairy micro chillers. So uh, if the micro chillers are of low cost, you know, if it is cost the farmers, let's say, you know, let's say the cost of producing it is 12,000 rupees, but the cost of ownership is two to 3,000. Uh, this will greatly, greatly improve the farmers earning capacity, uh, that kind of uh, funding. So while uh, government looks at bridge financing for large infrastructure project, this is, you know, reaching out to the central government to provide similar bridge financing to the smaller farmers to help, you know, enhance uh, their income. Uh, 
um, initiate an annual ag tech national recognition award for introduction of new technology. Let there be an annual championships of what impacts, you know, what is ag tech, which impacts the small scale farmers. Let there be a championship for this. And that will encourage and create an environment uh, for more and more research work happening in India. Uh, dispersal of power subsidy in all states for cold storage, which is similar to Gujarat model, but it is not prevalent in all other states. Uh, if it can be done, you know, across all states, that will be really helpful for the cold storage. Let's come to the third segment, which is processing, which is establishing first the NEAT. Um, so if you look at... Right. Yeah. You shifted to the previous one where you are giving three models, three previous one. Ah, ah, this is that. Can you, can you, uh, the, the examplets which you were talked about. Next slide. Okay. Yes, this so you can one slightly, is... now you can slightly expand because there can be a lot of startups who will be looking at this one because the Ergos model is very important. Can you, uh, give more input on this that you know so yeah so so basically what it does is that they do, they're not uh, ergos is not looking at ownership of warehouses what ergos is doing is you know renting out warehouse space close to where the farming clusters are and they might be looking at very small warehousing so they're not looking at large warehousing because the farmer might be wanting to store just one bag few bags so you don't have to have a truckload farmer brings it himself puts it there so bringing the warehouse close to where the produce is rather than asking the farmer to come to where the production center is. So it is building a network of warehousing. Okay, so this is one thing that they are doing. Now having put the produce there, the farmer is always in need of cash. So what they are trying to do is through non-banking financial institutions, you know, saying, okay, we have this uh, storage here. We can provide you with the warehouse receipt. Uh, please fund the farmer basis, you know, 80% or, you know, whatever is negotiated uh, stock that is lying in the warehouse, please give him funds so that the farmer has an ability to run his family. But at the same time, if there is an upside, he enjoys the upside. Because remember in the previous uh, graph I showed you at the time of harvesting, uh, the prices go down. So if the farmer waits, then the prices will be evening out a lot more. And it also provides a market linkage. So they are storing certain commodities. Then, you know, companies can come in and say, okay, we have these commodities. You can, you know, buy it. And the farmers then are able to sell it to uh, directly, you know, um, larger volume. So they can have a better price realization, which can happen. Very good. Thank you. So let's look at processing. You know, if you look at processing in the US, it's about 65% of agriculture produce is processed. In India, uh, in Canada, in China, it's about 23%. Why China? China is also fragmented like India. You know, size of holdings are also fragmented, but you see the percentage which is being processed. Now, India data varies between 2% and 7%. I'm taking the higher data of 7%. But that is all that we are processing. So if you're processing less, then you're selling a lot more raw, in which case the value realization for the farmer is lesser. If, if you process more, then the value realization for the farmer is more. So thrust on processing. And obviously, you know, at various levels, I have put down that there are various kinds of losses which happen. Uh, and, and all that leads between field and folk, uh, you know, leads to losses for the farmers. And all that gets priced in the, you know, in, with farmers. So when it comes to sourcing of raw material, the farmer, as it is, you know, he grows 100. He's able to sell 60. So he's already incorporating 40. Uh, the next level of aggregator expects that, you know, I will have five loss. So he buys 60, but in his pricing, he will price it for 55. Everything gets back-ended, you know, transfer to the farmer. So there is a need to focus on all this and, you know, so what is the objectives of food policy is to protect the poor from crisis by providing access to food, develop market that enhance efficient resource utilization and decrease food wastage will promote an increase in farmer income. This is the objective of any kind of a food policy. So the situation today is that the food processing industry is highly fragmented, you know, while there is some large companies, you have the Tata's and you have the ITC's and you have Britannia and you have livers, but these are very, very small, minuscule portion of what is available in India and what is produced in India versus what these companies do. 
So unorganized sector accounts for 70 percent of the total market, and that's the current reality of India. So there is a need. There is a definite need to push processing. Now we're talking about a specific hub and spoke model because you can't take processing. Processing requires a huge amount of investment. So we're saying that you know a hub and spoke model will really help. How will the hub and spoke model help? Um, harvest is you know synchronized with demand. So if the spokes are close to uh, where uh, the farmer is growing, the farmer need not you know harvest everything. Farmer doesn't need to harvest everything on day one. He can wait. He can stagger it out. So as and when the demand comes up, he can harvest. So he can you know st keep it on the field and not. So that's one big advantage. Uh, farmers are able to make better harvesting decision. You know, should I harvest it now? Should I harvest this later? Because he has spoke which is giving him market information. And post-harvest losses are reduced. So what is the role of the spoke? Closer linkage between processors and farmers. Uh, alternate near farmer markets for farmers. So they provide, you know, alternates. There are farmer markets which are available, but this is an alternate to processing. Given the value addition that the processing will provide, they should be giving a higher price to the farmer. Uh, better and transparent prices, like I said, they will get a better pricing. And primary processing activities like sorting, grading, uh, is all things which are happening at the spoke itself. So that reduces, you know, cost and time uh, in taking produce to the hub. Uh, so the hub uh, efficiencies go up. Um, this, this is a model which is suitable for a single company or multiple companies can also do it. You know, there is a lot of focus on mega food parks and I will talk about one of the mega uh, food parks that we are going to discuss about and uh, they can do the same hub and spoke model. Uh, so it is singular company, multiple companies. It's, and the model provides a bridge between farmers and consumers providing extension services up to processing and packaging of facilities. So let's look at a report card for this. Uh, so government provides a consistent enabling policy framework and support uh, direct and indirect subsidies to promote processing. Uh, provide uh, entrepreneurship and uh, the private sector provides their entrepreneurship and equity capital. And they take up capital investment for value addition and bridge farmers and end users. And the civil society, they play their role of capacity building and information dissipation. Uh, the government in most uh, is form of subsidies. Uh, the government is providing subsidies and credit facilitation to medium and large pro uh, processes. Um, and and uh, they are right now, you know, also government has introduced a lot of facilities which are focused towards direct engagement of smallholder farmers. Now, lots of initiatives done by the government, scale is missing at this point of time because we are very early into the government announcements and it will take a natural course of some passage of time. I'm very hopeful, you know, things will change dramatically. So at this point of time, we score the government as a yellow. Uh, the private sector, only few processes have set up uh, near farm direct linkage. So lots of models which are coming up, uh, addressing small holder farmers, but you know, still um, the, uh, in terms of uh, scale, there is not enough. So uh, the small holder, the private sector also scores a yellow. There is a lot more uh, that the FPOs can do. There are very few FPOs which are managed, aggregate, produce, and set up successful processing facility. This can dramatically, dramatically change the life of farmers if the FPOs start taking up you know processing initiatives and say okay we understand farmers will be more willing trusting with us it is you know group of farmers coming this will could completely change the income outcome for farmers if this were to happen uh, very few ngos and government as agency which facilitate set up of processing units and this. so they score a red there is a lot of scope of things which can happen there not enough happening um Let's look at uh, uh, the roles for farmers in midstream processing. What are the restrictions as far as farmers and farmer collectives are facing as far as this is concerned? Lack of awareness or know-how, you know, as far as farmers are concerned. Farmers do not usually look beyond cultivation. Uh, so they are not aware of what is happening downstream, you know, from the cultivation. And... Uh, 
there is a need for you know hand holding them and that hand holding is being provided by manufacturing of low cost processing technologies and civil societies which is you know currently happening but the scale is you know like i said earlier is missing um lack of marketing and business skill now, as far as farmers are concerned this is the challenge that they have they don't understand you know how they understand how to grow food they don't know how to sell a product or the business acumen the financial skills which is required for all that um i know of civil societies in africa which are you know actually doing courses in finance for the farmers just basic finance 101 for them to understand you know whether it is managing your home budget or cost or you know basic things which can help so that's a big intervention which there can be done for farmers um there are only very few farmers which are you know looking at collectives which are successfully marketing and branding a produce uh in the absence of buyers there is you know uh, uh it is it's very difficult for farmers to invest in processing unit and this becomes very risky uh this is the farmers and farmer groups are a weaker economic status and therefore unable to make investments in food processing unit um even the government subsidies are more you know back ended which means it's not given up front you first invest and then we will give you the money so it you know especially for small scale farmers and fpos this is just not going to help them so there is a need for differentiation as far as you know the government is doing it so that there is no abuse of the system so one understands that but there is a need for bridging and understanding the realities of you know the fpo organization and the village enterprise level organization versus uh, the subsidy more for medium and large scale processors uh small scale operation so they have a small scale operation and therefore you know scale is normally missing and therefore cost goes up because of the scale factor economies of scale is um what are the challenges uh, with respect to contract farming that comes across you know so this is you know um as far as processing is concerned needs to go back into contract farming um so that you know there is a link between processing and uh, farming so you have difficulty in enforcing agreements so farmers get into an agreement and then uh, if there are no central enforcement agencies which are looking into this uh, uh whether at a state level or whether at a national level then it will be very difficult to enforce contracts and therefore development will never happen and the farmer is very you know sometimes short sighted and might just sell his produce to somebody who is giving him slightly more rather than looking at a long term benefit that the farmer is so used to getting short changed that when the opportunity comes he get he just grabs it but there is need for you know some intervention from state government central governments to put these infrastructures in place um high risk activity concern you know the time effort investment required you know most companies will prefer not to go and set up you know farming and take the agonies of you know going out there and producing all that they would rather go to the mandis and pick up you know because the work required in farming is you know completely back breaking and doesn't matter whether it's a small farmer or a big company which is doing it um there is a hesitation to compromise existing relationship farmers have you know tie up with middlemen for a very long time middlemen and farmers stay together in the same villages know each other take you know farmers go for them for credit for personal loans for you know they want to put a kid uh, uh, you know want to pay a school fees or they want to build a roof repair a roof uh, they can't go to the bank and take money so they have an existing relationship over decades so they just don't want to break all that and go to somebody for contract farming because yes you can buy my produce at a you know higher level but what happens when i need help i don't know where to go to except this guy and if he if i break my relationship with him then i have no access so all this needs to be comprehensively addressed in order to move in this direction um so what are the interventions for small holder benefits uh, some of the interventions you know are uh, mega food parks which the government is looking at you know Uh, there are lots of legislations which have been made uh, it is going to help the small holder farmer uh, by ensuring that you know they have a connection between uh, you know where this is being processed and where they are growing so if the mega food parks are closer to the producing area then there are lesser losses and there is higher value realization for the small holder for farmers fdi 100% is allowed in uh, food processing 
and therefore there could be huge investments which and flip which happens in processing and this will again help you know in smallholder farmers in giving him better value realization and reducing his farm losses uh backward and former linkages is being uh, looked at whether it's through processing centers and farm gate models whether it is you know through uh, um, schemes that the government is announcing or whether it's through various innovative models which the small companies are looking at uh once it is reach scale this is also going to help the small scale farmers in you know enhancing his value uh looking at agro processing clusters there there are you know the government is looking at you know setting up processing uh, companies together in you know wherever there is close to farming clusters and this is again will help the small holder farmers now some of the work which is happening is by isap which i mentioned earlier uh, development research foundation nandi foundation which is in small scale primary processing and these are all csos linking uh, civil societies linking farmer and processing marketing and branding support so this is civil society helping farmers in you know value addition so that their realization goes up isap is also connecting fpos to consumers in delhi housing societies to enhance their farmer income uh, there are a couple of companies gala food mapro foods mapro food grows strawberries uh, very nice strawberries in mahabaleshwar uh, they not only grow strawberries the whole Mahabaleshwar economy has changed because of these two three companies which are based there. Not only do they grow, they buy from other farmers which are there. So Junak Farms, Inspira Farms, near farm processing units uh, decreases elapsed time between harvesting and preparation. So these are some of the processing interventions. I've looked at two exemplars. You know, one is India Food Park. Now, if you look at the photograph on the top, it's very interesting. You see some silos. Uh, and uh, you see some processing uh, you know processing units and then you see you know some solar panels on top of you know some buildings so smaller packaging units can be subletted out uh, to smaller companies and the midstream processing can be a shared resources where farmer brings in you know so there is integrated ecosystem for agro and food processing in this model uh it's the india food park that we are talking about uh, infrastructure for enhanced in, uh, innovation you know so there is r and d facilities that happens there um, ready to move in so you just have everything built in you just come in you know set up you open a company and you just go in there no no need to wait for construction and building facilities and storage and processing you are a company which is in agri just go in there in that geography just set up so this and the farmers close by so they also tying up with farmers uh product focused so they are looking at you know what is growing in that area and the infrastructure is focusing on the products which is happening and providing strategic partnerships between you know looking at an fmcg on one side and looking at the agriculture farmers on the other side so this was a brilliant model which i thought you know would like to share uh then there is another company called impagro Uh, Impagro is, you know, looking at connecting uh, food processors, exporters, uh, caterers, and retailers at one end, and farmers at another end. And how do they do that? They provide pre-harvest solution, access to high-quality agri-input services and technology, promotion of agri practice and sustainable uh, natural resources. So that's one that pre-harvest solutions that they provide. and then there is post harvest solutions that they post harvest storage and processing facilities that they provide and access to high value markets so they build a bridge something that they provide to the farmers something that they provide to the end customers and they bring it all together so impagro was another very powerful business model so i thought i will put it out there as in uh, processing white space and opportunities government facilities group working capital um, there is a need for you know government to provide working capital for fpos and vpos without collateral they are smaller companies cannot have collateral go to the banks they need collateral so there has to be a need for the government to do that encouragement for fpo to set up vegetable and food integrated packaging units near railway lines within 200 kilometers of main consumption centers so that you know railway is much faster and this is something which can be really changing the life of farmers which stay close to railway lines Uh, provide tax breaks and subsidies for upgradation of small scale processing in rural setup 
help establish indigenous brands and agro commodities specific to geographies where processing and managed by FPOs. Uh, this is basically to encourage you know employment generation among rural women and rural communities. Uh, encourage extension of small working capital loan to women self help group. Then provide subsidies for testing pesticide residue detection. There is a lot of focus on growing organic farming, but all the guys who are focusing on organic farming, there's hardly anybody that I've come across which is re testing for pesti pesticide residue detection. And that is one intervention which is required. Now, the lab and the equipment which is required is very, very expensive. So, the government pushes for that. There is, you know, build bridges saying that, okay, we will, you know, fund it. We will ensure that, you know, this uh, equipment we are able to provide, the FBO can run it. Uh, it will provide value enhancement for the farmers, bring, uh, you know, the integrators of uh, customers and the farmers together, increasing the, so specific interventions, increasing the um, value realization for farmers. Let's look at market linkages, our last one. Um, uh, if we look at, you know, vegetables and fruits, uh, we see how the cost buildup happens between the farmer and the consumer. And it varies between 3 to 3x. Uh, between what the farmer realizes and what the consumer pays. It's not a percentage increase. I'm talking about a multiple three and a half X times, you know, what the farmer realizes. And how is it, you know, if we can reduce the intermediaries, this is how we can, you know, uh, by providing better linkages, we can ensure that the farmer realizes better value. So what is the weak market orientation? Is that there is a information which arbitrage, there's less information that the farmer has limited avenues to sell their products, there are numerous middlemen between growers and consumers, limited visibility to demand. And therefore, there is a situation of frequent oversupplies and shortage impacting price and wastage. Farmers have a low bargaining power because of fragmentation and over-dependence on middlemen. So they are highly fragmented and dependent on middlemen. Regulated markets are currently present at 462 square kilometers instead of every five square kilometers. So regulated markets are just not enough. And therefore, a farmer has to depend on unregulated markets. Uh, crop sowing, and this is very interesting, is a function of prevailing market price in the last season. So the you know, farmer says, okay, last season prices are very high, so let me grow a lot more. And when he grows a lot more, then you know he has an oversupply and he always you know, gets lesser value because all the farmers are doing that. And there is just not enough information. So there's no projected market demand resulting in oversupply and price losses. Now, the efficient model, the traditional model of, you know, was to link uh, farmers with middlemen and more middlemen and mundis and more middlemen and more middlemen, then leading to groceries and then to, uh, you know, hotels. But there is now, you know, models, newer models which are coming up. One is a marketplace model where a farmer brings it into marketplace, which grows directly into grocery shops, hotels, the restaurant. Or a reseller model where, you know, farmer sells directly to a reseller and he sells it in shop. You know, so a Reliance uh, Farm Fresh is a great, you know, reseller model where, you know, they will buy directly from the farmers. They will have collection centers and then they sell it directly through their shops. This greatly affects in benefiting the uh, small scale farmer and reducing the losses. And basically ICT is something which is used uh, platforms in bringing this about. Um, linkage, various, uh, you know, whether there is uh, digital platforms, which is, I, I will not go into this slide, I'm running out of time. So it is all out there in terms of various models which are existing, no, whether it is at FPO time. level. Yeah. Mr. Raj, you have time, please, you know, because it is, you are explaining very effectively and, uh, you know, you don't have the constraint. Please carry on. Okay, okay. Uh, so, so the, the market linkages model are looking at, you know, various strategies, you know, whether it is crop harvesting or whether the harvesting primary processing or storage or market linkage at various stages, what are the various strategies, whether it is, you know, cultivation, whether, you know, the nature of the cultivation, which is happening or the nature of harvesting or processing on the nature of storage, uh, which is required or the market linkage, which is required. So various strategies, which are there and the different kind of, models, whether it is farmer producer organization led model, or is it a uh, smallholder group or, a, you know, farmer support group 
model which is you know looking at these kind of processing or approach to market or agri agriculture entrepreneur you know uh, i remember one of uh, the industry stalwarts talking about during covid saying that you know all the rural uh, you know laborers have moved back uh, into you know rural setups and what if we were to generate rural employment by encouraging entrepreneurship in those mar in those location through you know processing there is already things which are happening in terms of you know farmers are growing so one brother grows uh, crops another brother stays in the village and is uh, uh, is growing the crop another one moves into the city is working in some company there if both of them go back to the city and one process and one grows you have you know a far more powerful model and the village economy improves and there is a far better realization uh, the younger brother which, which grows the crop uh can get a better realization and the family is better off because the elder brother now looks at processing uh so mechanics uh, various is primary collection centers which i talked about you know like the uh, farm fresh reliance model that i talked about uh, contractual agreements where you know companies are getting into contractual agreements saying that okay we are going to process and now we want to you know get into farmers and we we will get into uh, agreements with them that we can provide the farmers could provide the labor for the farm so one of the important ones is in a contractual agreement where you are not taking away the farmer from what he does but you engage him saying that okay we will provide all inputs we can aggregate so we can buy it cheaper uh, so we can you know ensure there's no losses so you have a better better realization uh, we take away the risk of the fluctuations on the uh, produce price so it's a more fee quality income so the farmer is assured of the money that he is going to make he is not left to you know prices going up and down and then there are digital platforms uh, which you know bring in together what is happening at the demand level which is uh, fragmented and again supplier level which is fragmented the ict you know digital platforms uh, help you you know today if i want to buy vegetables uh, my wife is not going to go to the market which what we used to do before covid we would go down and you know go to the local market and we would love to you know buy the vegetables ourselves what she does is you know the night before she has to put in an uh, order in you know one of the services that she uses and places an order uh, the night before so if the night before you order it then they have a visibility to what is required and that company will work through the night will provide that input to the supply centers which are then linked back to the farmers in ensuring that by you know 4 o'clock the trucks move and by 6 o'clock Uh, whatever has been by 12 midnight been ordered by 6 o'clock in the morning fresh vegetables are there in my house so now that is an innovation which is happening in city after city irrespective of whichever city you are staying in i think covid has made a huge difference in making that as you know a very successful business model let's look at a report card as far as market linkages is concerned what is the government's role is in policy formulation providing access uh infrastructure as ass, uh, assistance in providing physical access to multiple uh, markets so like i said you know roads cannot be built by private enterprise that has to be done by the government or railways can't be so they need to do all that uh, price dissemination information there's not enough of that happening now that is something that they need to do uh, while that does happen through the msp for uh, non perishables but for perishables there is nothing so that is something that the government could do building connectivity between multiple markets you know if there is an excess in punjab and haryana and there is a shortage in karnataka and andhra then that is something that the government can really help in supporting out um what does the private sector do it does it assist in private uh, price discovery on a daily basis you know what is the price discovery this is the price that we are willing to buy uh, provides assurance of off take guarantees that we if you growing it we will buy this Uh, supports physical purchase close to farm gate they will buy it closer quick dispersal of payment post transaction farmer normally gets you know payment within you know 24 hours the farmer will get credited and uh, unlike you know um, some uh, unregulated markets where the farmer may not be getting paid even in the mandis they get a very quick they get paid very quickly but unregulated markets it's left to you know the vagaries of the market practices 
support and facilitating advance for input purchase. You know, private sector can also provide them money, saying that if you want to buy fertilizer and seed, then we will give you credit and you can do that. And then we can later on deduct and that builds a relationship with the farmer. And, you know, he, they're doing exactly what, you know, the small um, village lender or the Mundi operator does. Um, and then, of course, the civil society does their role, traditional role of training and information dissemination. Government has done a lot in terms of market linkages and a lot of initiatives that has been done because, you know, a lot of that work is in the policy area. That's why they score a green uh, farm market linkages, APMC markets, uh, connecting all the APMC markets, ENAM, lots of initiatives that the government has done. Uh, regulatory environment, which the government has created, you know, helps in uh, promotion of uh, market linkages uh, through various models, encouragement to companies, private companies, or even FPOs. A lot has been done. Areas where they could possibly look into it as interventions we will look at in next stage. Private sector is more, uh, you know, only a few large processors and retailers have managed to get close. Um, provide market linkages. So there is a lot of model out there. We have made a very interesting beginning. The jury is out there. I'm convinced in time. Once we reach scale, uh, the report card will change. Uh, at this point of time, it's yellow. Lots of innovative models out there. And civil society uh, has done their bit you know, in terms of uh, facilitating buyer linkages uh, and undertaking. Some of them are taking procurement and distribution themselves. And some civil societies also provide information, training, and market advisory to farmers through physical or digital platforms. So they've also done a considerable amount of work, a lot of initiatives. Scale is missing. That's why they score a yellow. And, and I'm sure it's just a matter of time. Things will drastically change in India. Um, market linkages, uh, challenges, and intervention. If you look at uh, what are the challenges, local market accounts for 80% of the market in India. Uh, so most uh, small farmers, you know, sell directly into these uh, markets and therefore uh, they are not very regulated. Realizations may not be very great. Uh, of course, these are, you know, the farmer markets that you have in the cities are completely different. Uh, farmer markets in the city gives you actually a higher value. But this we are talking about closer to, let's say, a rural market where it is growing. And if you are driving down the highway, you will find, you know, people with baskets of tomatoes lying on the road and, you know, selling it at dirt cheap prices. And that is what we are talking about. Doesn't really, you know, it's not very regulated and the value realization is very low. Um, regulation of APMC market uh, accounts for about 20% market in India. But like I said, you know, very distant, not too many. So uh, that's a current challenge we could have do with a lot more mandis. So the government has come up with a new regulation saying that any storage warehousing can be seen as a mandi. You know, so they are encouraging the project that I'm working with the government in Maharashtra is a Maharashtra State Warehousing Corporation. And we are building up a smart agriculture logistics, which will double up as a mandi along a highway, which is coming up. You know, so it's an integrated project. Uh, and the government is, you know, facilitating through regulation of all this. Um, so there are existing challenges, you know, in local market, there's lack of, you know, grading storage facilities in the local markets. And in Mandi's, there are restrictive APMC laws. Of course, the APMC laws have been changed. I personally believe that they will provide a lot of Philip uh, to the small scale farmer. Uh, I am, I, you know, there, um, on another platform, I did talk about the farmer protest. And I feel that this is very uh, small segment of the farmer. Um, who really don't understand um, why, you know, how they are getting impacted. And uh, you, the government can't look at, you know, uh, a very small percentage of farmer hijacking the interest of, you know, 99% of the farmers. Uh, and therefore, that move is in the right direction. Uh, so there are a lot of uh, government interventions which have happened, uh, market reforms that the government has done, uh, uh, whether it's within the state or whether it is, you know, private sector led in initiatives, contract farming laws, linking of uh, uh, various markets through ICT. So various interventions which have happened or direct link to bulk buyers through private sector, um, warehousing and cold storage facilities or perishable outlets for APMC, you know, uh, promotion of FDI, integration of futures 
market for farm produce. You know, today uh, in the project that we are talking about, um, this is for cotton. We are saying that you know, farmers can come and uh, Jinner can, uh, can be run by an FPO. Um, the land is providing by the, uh, by the state agency. Uh, the multilateral agency provides, uh, let's say, the machinery for ginning. So for the FPO, the cost of processing is zero. So they operate on the basis of a cost plus, which means you know they have a variable cost. They don't have a fixed cost that they need to cover. And the realization that they have, they pass it on to the farmer. So farmer, instead of selling raw cotton, now are able to sell lint. And then we provide structured financing where we will then tie up with textile mills, which can give off-take guarantees, or they can be tendered into the cotton tender markets and there can be guarantees either through tendering or through physical markets of you know mills buying directly from the farmer so greatly changing the life of farmers because of that project and i'm very passionate and my involvement in that project is because i felt that you know this is something which could change the life of farmers uh, living in and around that area um, so market linkages uh, i'm talking about just one uh, company which is farm mobi uh, which is you know looking at uh, farm movie is looking at pack house management uh, they do look at farm they are connecting you know retailers uh, uh, and uh, consumers with uh, suppliers manufacturers and they set up distribution and the farmers on one side and consumers on all side and then through the retailer distribution manufacturers through ict so they have in their chain retailers um, and, and logistics management and uh, regulators, manufacturers, processors, growers, everybody is in that part of this. So the farm movie company is, you know, looking at contract farmings, looking at uh, agri-division ecosystem, standardized farming, tissue culture, hydroponics, aquaponics, everything, blockchain traceability, a lot of things, you know, which have been put in as a value for the farmer and the realization therefore goes up for the farmer because of the comprehensive nature of what this company is trying to do in terms of various market linkages that it is providing to the farmers. What, is, what else could be done? Um, so market linkages, uh, government could develop forward, forward market for perishable. There is no, there is a forward marketable for non-perishable, but nothing for perishable. So food, vegetables, meats, milk and eggs, if there can be a forward market which is linked, you know, if, if the farmer knows that I will have a crop which is coming up in, let's say, June, my harvesting is coming up in June, and the, uh, if he is left to a physical market, he knows that the realization when I harvest is low. But let's say the forward market in uh, April, May for delivery in June is high, and he says, I'm covering my cost of production, plus I'm making a little money. Let me sell 30 40% of what I am going to produce. Let me lock it in. So a forward market will help him in doing that. Uh, built national platform for capturing inputs on uh, farm-wise acreage, volume harvested, ownership of dairy farm animals, build a platform uh, nationally because today with the big data initiative and all the things, you know, there is a need to understand for the government that this data is a national treasure. All this can only happen if there is a platform for doing it. Today, the platform is... There is no national platform which is, you know, there. And there is, um, let's say, every private company doing its bit. When every private company is doing it, then that data belongs to that company. It doesn't belong to the nation. Uh, the best, I'll give you an example. The best genetic work which has been done in the world is not in human beings. It's in animals. Uh, where? In New Zealand. And in which sector? In dairy. And what has brought about this development is because the dairy cooperative society in New Zealand, everything is under the cooperative. You know, just Amul is like, you know, inspired by what Fonterra, which is the cooperative in New Zealand, um, where all the data is nationally owned. Every research university uh, can get into the data, anywhere can go, and that data is owned by the nation and not by any individual, and research work is available for them. Um, I'm also suggesting crop insurance to be mandatory and linked to updating data on so once you have the platform, sowing, sowing acreage of different crops grown by the farmers. 
Why? Because sowing data will be used for as guidance for farmers on predictable, realizable price. Because if more and more people are sowing, then the prices will go down. So if the farmer says, oh, I have already, you know, the demand was 100. And based on last year's price, the sowing is already 125. I'm not going to sow more of this crop. Because if I grow more of this crop, prices will come down. And price guidance can then be on a real-time basis. So all this platform linkages and national data and by ensuring that crop insurance is mandatory, let, help the small farmer saying that, okay, the government will pay the premium for your behalf. We will also put a corpus fund. If you're not able to make your cost of production, we will make the, we will pay you money. If there is a crop failure, insurance company will pay you the money. But you need to be on this and be able to do the data. We can have, you know, companies, self-help companies, which will put the data on your behalf. And we will provide infrastructure support in the villages where these data inputs can happen. And all that happens in the health services on phones, mobile phones and things like that. So I'm sure this can be replicated also in agriculture. Build platforms are delivered uh, market realizable rate from farmer's location to market basis forward freight coating. So once you have a platform, also get railways and logistics onto that platform saying, give us a forward freight. So that the farmer says, if I am here based in, let's say, I am in Jharkhand, uh, I am growing this crop and I want to sell it in Andhra. As a small farmer, he says, okay, I have two choices. I Let me see which market will give me, if I take it by road or if I take it by rail, uh, which will give me a better price realization and let me, you know, send it to that market. Now, integrating all that could be something that the government can do through the forward market. Uh, building national genetic data for cattle to track productivity, disease resistance, and fertility, like I talked about, uh, you know, the model, genetic model, which is there in New Zealand. This is something that I think government of India should promote. That was all that I had to say. I have put down, uh, you know, some of my numbers here and also links to IFAMA. Uh, on various you know social media platforms and the farmer website um, i will be happy to take any questions i think i have exceeded slightly more but i think it was very interesting and i'm i'm personally very passionate about this as an issue about doubling farmer income so once again professor moni thank you for this opportunity from the bottom of my heart really have enjoyed this session Uh, Professor Moni, I can't hear you. You can't be heard. You are on mute. You can, you, you yeah, can, can put hear. the slide which is uh, previous to thank you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. I'll, 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 I'll just do that. I'll just do that. Can you see? No, it, it doesn't come. It is, uh... Uh, can you see the slide? Let me see. Um, if you can't see it, then let me let me just just hold on a second. I need to share it. Share screen. Share screen. Share. Yeah, the next one. Yeah, can you see it now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Next one. So this is the previous to thank you. Yeah, yeah, that's true, that's true. okay. Previous one. But this is a very important one that you know you have given uh, as a uh, what the government should do it. No, this is what you have given it, uh, yeah. and uh, let me you know. Go, go by that and uh, and then your last slide so thank you also let me capture it so that i'll keep it as an important thing that um, okay very nice that so i i, I you know it is a very important thing that uh, which uh, you have uh, brought it out which we are very happy about it and uh, 
uh, let me you can close these uh, you know presentation mr raj mm. you know I, I from my bottom of my heart i should thank you with my folded hands and for the last one and a half hours talk you brought out issues which should become the part of the government policy if at all you know government is interested to bring it out and uh, you know the last slide which i put it that you have said it very clearly that you know that you know build national platform and the building national platform isn't very important if you go to the department of space they have got restrictions to get remote sensing imageries and constraints and so on and so forth even though the government has been talking for the last 10 years open government open data access and uh, open apis and so on and so forth but today you have brought it out that until unless you built up the national platforms with the digital technology we have to convert national you know india is an agrarian economy and the whole world is moving towards digital platform is a platform economy with ecosystems and uh, i have been voicing for decades together <coughs> as a person who brought it in agriculture way back from 95 onwards until unless india is digitalized through the seven mission board project which we have suggested through the doubling farmers income you also said it that 99% of the farmers has to be facilitated and uh, the digit building national uh, uh, platform digital platform is the need of the hour digitalizing indian agriculture is the need of the hour Dig you know building up digital agriculture platform is an important thing and uh, and you also quoted an example from you know new zealand that how they built up national genetic model and how to get best practices which is available in health systems health informatics value chain how to bring it over here but dr rajvardhan i think today is the big input big knowledge um, advancement engagement for all the research scholars startups and uh, the ngos who would like to you know understand the post production intervention maximizing value for farmers you have done a wonderful job. You know, this is the 47th edition. And I'll be very happy to, you know, request you that let us prepare a policy paper from these two centers of excellence and yourself to be, to be put up to the government through the university. Because today what you have talked about, the title should be post-production intervention, maximizing values for farmers. Let it be the title of the policy paper because you have done it very nicely like 10 principles you have talked about the the mode of value chain he put it into four steps this is harvesting and primary processing storage logistic and crop protection processing and market linkages very systematically structured you know these four areas and then also you set it out in for each area step you have gone into six further steps it means that during the last one and a half hours you have gone into six in you know, four into six 24 steps you know 24 areas where you have concentrated that what should be done what is happening and you're also given a report card and many of the places that we are not able to see the green bullet we are able to see only red and yellow and this is if india is an agrarian economy the whole world has to work like a civil society and a civic society and we have to bring in civics manner and uh, we you know the civil society cannot be a liability it should be a facilitator and uh, these three categories you brought it you know government private and civil society organizations they should take a lead there are some of the areas they have taken a lead and if you have a 6.5 lakhs villages there are more than 6.5 lakhs 
you know, civil society organization in the country, registered with the government, then why the village is still called as a last mile connectivity? You know that it should be the first mile connectivity. If you have so, you know, that's why you have said it that many of the cases, even the civil society organization also is in the yellow category or in the red category. You know, so this is, is a very important thing that you were four into six, 24 categories of discussions today is very important. That's why I thought that I should request you that this one and a half hours discussion and plus by 30 minutes initial discussion, you know, uh, introduction can become a very good policy paper on police, you know, the post-production intervention, maximizing value for farmers. Very important because you have said it very clearly that the in harvesting and pri uh, primary processing, you say that the, the, you know, the presentation starts the value chain at the point where the farmer has harvested the crop and is ready to initiate primary processing. What all the problems he has it. And, uh, you know, that, uh, you know, uh, you know, how he should, you know, what should be the establishing need and what should be the report card and what is the challenges he faces and the intervention which is needed and the examplars he has given with the core examples. So if anybody has a problem, they can dial the these examplars which you have put it, you know, each one you have got about four into three, 12, you know, examplars category you have put it. So the 12 people at the national level, at the you know state levels, which covers almost all the states which you have covered, and it is basically a national presentation. You are not skewed to some particular state or particular area, and uh, this is an international food and agri you know agri uh, agricultural you know manage, uh, management association. You have really brought the you know the the culture of this IA, IFA MA you know uh, one which is, uh, you know, I was seen the founding fathers today, you have, you know, uh, given this, the, the, the journey which the founding fathers of IFAMA has done it now it, on 20, 2021, you have done that one. I was so happy and I thought that I should mention it. And then you also given it that, you know, that what is the white space and opportunities? Normally in digital area only in the communication, we always used to say white space which is not being used, you know, that why don't we have it to reach the last mile connectivity? And you also put it as a last point, white spaces and opportunities. And it, it, it is not a, you know, you never talked about, uh, you didn't mention it, it is a black box or white box. Let it be there as a way of seeing black boxes and white boxes. But this is a time that with the digital era, we have to go for open innovation and value creation network in the digitalized world for self-reliant economy. And in that connection, these white spaces and opportunities are important thing. And Dr. Jabamalai Vinanchi Arachi, former principal advisor, you know, to the director general UNIDO, he talked about on open, you know, open innovation and that value creation network, digitalized world for self-reliant economy. So I'm and I'm linking it with your white spaces and opportunities, and it is a very. I wish and we will also promote to make many of the research students to get into this area and to see to that how to undertake research and for studies. You know, with respect to these four into six areas, because 24 areas title which you have given for. Hello, are you able to hear me? Hello. Hello. You froze for a minute, Hello. Professor Moni. Now we can hear you. We can hear you. Hello. Now. Hello, we can Hello. hear you, Professor Moni. We can hear you. Hello, are you able to hear me? We can hear you. Yes, yes. we can hear you. Yes, sir. We can hear you now. Yes,
Hello. Are you able to hear me? Yes, yes, Professor Moni. We can hear you. Hello, are you able we, to hear me? We can hear you, we can hear you. Okay, so that was okay, okay, very nice there. Because there was some problem that I was not able to, you know. Am I audible now? Yes, you're audible. Hello? Yes, you're audible. Okay. And uh, so I was talking about that. Um, at that time, internet connectivity was an uh, issue. And uh, this 4 into 6, 24 areas give an ample opportunity for the research scholars and research students to get to do that. So, and, uh, you know, Mr. Raj Bharadhan, and you have done a wonderful, uh, you know, talk address to the, our national webinar series on doubling formats in 2022. Atmanir Bar Bharat in Agriculture, Post-Production Intervention Maximizing Value for Farmers. And the Honorable Chancellor has sent a message. He was, uh, uh, you know, is 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 in uh, Gurgaon. He was not, uh, you know, he's, uh, he's busy with the university meeting. And he would like to have a separate meeting with you. And with you, whenever, you know, either through virtual meeting or when you visit, um, Mayur are phase two where the university corporate office is there. He would like to see you and meet and discuss further on this uh, talk. And uh, it is a very important talk. And uh, and especially that uh, I, you know, you talked about that building up national platform for capturing inputs on farmer wise acreage. Volume harvested, ownership is very important. If you see the uh, doubling farmers' income um, uh, report, income by 2022 report, which was submitted to the government in 2018, the volume 12B talks about that uh, digital technology in agriculture. And there, the, under the seven mission mode project, we put it digitalized agricultural resources information system and micro level planning for ushering in you know smart village and smart farming in india we don't have a comprehensive national farmers database comprehensive and also that uh, we don't have a comprehensive digitalized agricultural resources information system we put it and the reports are available. I was the member secretary of the task force of uh, National Natural Resource Management System, NNRMS, of the Department of Space. It is given a task force report under the uh, chairmanship of Dr. Kundra. He is an IAS officer from Haryana Kader. He was at that time principal advisor in plan commission. I was uh, the, the deputy director general from NIC working in the agriculture sector. I was the secretary for this uh, you know, task force. And this is a very important thing that we have to have a national database on farmer wise and farm wise. It's very important. And uh, you have also very nicely put it that you built it up about three national platforms are more important. And anybody who is doing research on this farm and farmer has to be a national database irrespective of whether it is to be is being done by self-help group or private sector or research organization or international organization on Indian farm or Indian farmer wise. It is a very important, you know, you know, uh, you know, uh, you, know uh, you know, idea, uh, you know, there's a, you know, uh, uh, outcome, you know, the input which we have to take it up, you know, for the further, you know, deliberations uh, for um, getting into policy uh, paper preparation. So with this, I would like to thank you for your uh, taking time in your busy schedule and uh, you know, to participate in the uh, you know, university's national webinar series on uh, doubling farmers income by 2022. And in one of the slides, you put it that this should be achieved by 2023. Even though you know that you say that when we talk about 2022, you put it 2023, and uh, that is that white spaces in all white spaces and opportunity you have put it that 
spec you know it specific government you know initiatives to be taken ensuring that farmers income is doubled by 2023 you have extended that you know the government mm -hmm. you know, deadline by one more year i hope that it is not a typo error you know it is 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 2023 but when i was uh, you know incorporating in the synopsis i noticed that but i thought that it is it is now is 2021 let us give one more year that to, to achieve it so for all the four areas you have given that doubling income by not 2022 but let us have by 2023 you know it is very important with this i thank you for your participation and let us work together you know uh, for the uh, improve you know for the benefit of the farming community especially for the small and marginal farming community and you have you know uh, to bring in how to you know realize the post production intervention for maximizing value for farmers thank you very much with this thank you we'll close thank the webinar you. and we will leave studio thank you very much thank you thanks thank for you. your thank participation you. and greeting from sobit university for more research inquiries please contact professor mori maraswamy professor emeritus and chairman center for agricultural informatics research uh, um, uh, research studies and center for agri business disaster management studies and former director general national informatics center government of india new delhi email id moni at sobit university ac dot ac dot in we will close the webinar and leave studio